right, everybody, welcome. This is our webinar on developing your team management skills. My name is Karen Krause, and I am the American Floral Endowments Manager of Communications and Outreach, as well as Staff Liaison to the Young Professionals Council. This webinar is being hosted by AFE's Young Professionals Council, or YPC for short, which is comprised of young floral industry professionals ages 18 to 35 years old. The council offers webinars, networking, and volunteer opportunities to aid in personal and to professional development for those in the floral industry. The YPC is completely free to join, so if you're looking for more resources like this, consider signing up today at endowment.org slash YPC. Another opportunity for young professionals that we'd like to note is SAF's Next Gen Live. The event will be held from February 25th to 27th in San Diego. The link to learn more and register will be shared in the chat. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available through AFE's YouTube. At the end of the presentation, we will stop the recording. So if you'd like to ask any questions outside of the recording, you can hold them until then. That being said, this is a fully interactive session. So we will stop throughout the presentation to answer questions. You can submit your questions through the chat, Q&A, or raise the hand so that you can ask your question verbally throughout those periods. As we get started, we actually have a poll for you. So if you could, please let us know what your current management role is. Our expert speaker today is Dr. Megan Bowman. Dr. Bowman is the Director of Research Operations at Ball Horticultural Company. As a member of Ball Helix, Megan leads research portfolio management, major infrastructure projects, laboratory safety, and global biotechnology regulatory and compliance. She has a PhD in plant breeding and plant genetics and has worked for several years leading project teams. She currently serves on AFE's Board of Trustees and serves as a committee member and mentor for ASHS. All right, awesome. Well, thank you everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. I'm Megan Bowman. I work at Ball Horticultural Company. I've been there for about five, a little over five years. Um, as part of that role, I've had the honor of being uh, a, a board member for the AFE Board of Trustees. And I've had the opportunity to work with the YPC on definitely different occasions. And so I was really excited to talk about something I'm pretty passionate about. Um, while I am still, I would say, I'd like to think I'm still pretty early in my career. Um, I've been, in, I've been having, I've had the opportunity to work with lots of different groups, different people, different organizations, and as a scientist. And so today I'm going to talk through some of the things that I've taken from those experiences and some things to consider. I'm sure, as Karen said, we want to have this be as interactive as we can. So if there's any questions or thoughts that come up, um, if you feel comfortable, please let me know. Um, Karen will moderate and ask any questions, and I'll also be on the lookout um, as we get going. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about first... What is it to be an engaging and effective team member versus being a manager? We often, especially those in technical fields, the more work, good work you do in any work environment, very often you're put in positions of responsibility of projects and of people. But very often you, we have a lot of experience as team members, but not necessarily team leaders. And so we'll talk about what are some differences there. Then we'll talk about some things to consider when stepping into a managerial role. I know I didn't get any formal manager training the first time I became a manager of people. Um, this, of course, will be a high-level overview <laughs> of things I've learned, um, but just some things to consider when you're looking at a managerial role. Um, there's a big difference, at least in my experience, between what I thought being a manager would be like versus what it actually is like in my own lived experience. And so I'll talk a bit about what that difference is. Um, some key strengths of what a good manager is. We will talk about managing versus, versus what a leader is. And then some tips and tools for managing people and their time. And if you have other tips and ideas that come up, um, those of you that are on the call, uh, I would love to hear them as well. This is a great platform to share information about things that have worked for you too. Okay, so I'm sure that most people who are attending this 
feel to some degree that you've either been on a team as an effective team member. We've been in teams since we were young and in school, right? Um, and we feel pretty solid about what it means to be an effective team member. Obviously, you want to have good communication skills, communication skills, not only with your peers, but also communicating necessary information about project work to a supervisor or you know, others in your organization, um, taking initiative and leading certain things when you can always is a good thing. Uh, very often coming from the science world, that's pretty common to see is people just kind of taking things and running with it, um, which is generally a good thing. Um, knowing your role on the team is really important. Not everyone um, is going to be a lead in certain parts of a team project, for instance. It's important to know what you bring to a team in a project and what that role is. Um, know your own strengths and growth opportunities and have a good idea of what the objectives are for the team that you belong in and how they fit into the goals of the organization. So yeah, these are all pretty common sense things, right? You know, we're all parts of teams in various shapes and forms. Um, depending on the organization that you are currently in. So how does that differ from being a really good manager? So to be a really great manager, you need to have not just good communication skills, you need to have excellent communication skills. And I'll talk more about, at least from my lived experience, what that can look like. Um, going above and beyond to communicate with your peers, with your team members, and with those who might be higher in the hierarchy or in, in leadership in your organization is an absolute requirement. Um, pretty simple as that. Sharing information whenever possible. I have found in my experience that information can be a really important tool. Um, keeping information um, almost very often serves no one. Um, when it's you know appropriate to share and so i have found the best working environments that i have existed in are the ones where people feel comfortable sharing openly what they um, are working on what they are stressed about what they're concerned about and just having that dialogue be open be really important as a manager taking initiative to support your team and champion their success so not only um, flying your own flag, but flying the, the flag of everyone in your in your group. No one likes it when there's a team manager who takes credit for what you know all of their team members have have been doing. But again, also knowing your role in the organization, it's important to know where you fit. And we'll talk a little bit about in a minute the different types of structures you might find yourself in, and how that matters as a manager. Um, being really aware of your own strengths and opportunities for development, and not only that, you have to commit to the growth and development of the members of your team. And that seems logical and completely intuitive, but especially as you start working in a managerial role, depending on the type of work that you do, the workload that you have, it can get very easy to get bogged down in thinking about what the next thing to do is to cross off your list and less about thinking about developing the members of your team. And then again, knowing your team's objectives and how they fit into the goals of the organization. And that seems logical, but I have personally experienced situations where it's actually not all that intuitive. Sometimes you form and be your part of teams where you may not know where you fit. As the leader or manager of your group, if you don't know where your team fits towards the goals of the organization, it's gonna be really hard to motivate the members of your team to do the work that they need to do. So we have some answers from pretty much everyone. We can go ahead and oh, cool. full results. Yeah, let's please, yep. Okay, currently in a management role. So it looks like most people on the call, cool, are in a management role of some sort um, or will be in the future. And we have a few that aren't currently managing employees. Well, awesome, cool. So we have a lot, kind of a round out group, I think. A lot of us are leading people or projects already. Um, and that's great. As you have your own insights and want to share, I completely welcome that from perhaps other perspectives you might have from managing teams. So what are some things to think about? Um, like it sounds like most people are in a management role, but these are always things that you can come back to, um, regardless of whether or not you've been leading people and projects for a considerable amount of time, or if this is something you've just starting to step into. Because frankly, <laughs> Like I said, most people, as you move through your career, 
you know, we generally reward people who do a great job as individuals with more people and responsibility and resources to manage. Um, but that doesn't mean that those people are actually skilled at managing people or resources. Um, that is incredibly true in the sciences, where you can be very much a technical expert, but maybe not the greatest people manager. Um, how that's rewarded and how that happens completely depends on the organization. Um, but it, obviously, I'm sure most people on the call will agree that managing people is very different than managing just projects or research or, um, you know, even just things that you're doing as a day to day in a very technical field. Um, and it's very easy to, to kind of ignore the really fundamentals of managing people when you get so busy in the technical aspects of projects. So just as a highlight, one thing that I have found really important that I didn't know very much about as a scientist until I started actually getting more into project management theory is understanding the type of organization that you are a manager in. Um, and this is kind of an overview slide. I mean, we're all smart people. Everyone can Google. Um, and there's lots of different texts and, and literature on the theory of organizations, but they're generally broken down into four different flavors. One is divisional. So um, that is a company, a company, an institute, uh, university, whatever, whatever have you, that is broken down into units that are self-contained. That could be, oh, I'm part of the human resources team. I'm part of the IT team. I'm in a company where I'm part of the research team. But everyone kind of has their silos, their divisions, um, as part of a larger company. People can also um, have their job and work func organized around functions. So um, this can be, you know, the people who are dealing with purchasing, you know, procurement. Um, so instead of it being higher, kind of larger bins, much more functional, much more, um, these are generally smaller groups, depending on the organization. Geographical. So obviously, if you work for an organization that has multiple locations, perhaps they're managed independently. And so you have a structure that is built within each geographic location. And then a matrix. And matrix is becoming more and more common and very likely many people on this call already exist in a matrix organization where um, the company is organized by kind of diverse teams that have specific tasks. Um, so a single team member might actually report to more than one person. Maybe they have a project team leader and that team leader is accountable for making sure a specific project gets done. Um, but maybe they have a supervisor that's in their, you know, HR area or what have you. And so now they've got multiple people asking for their time and their resources. Uh, and so navigating that can be complex. And it's also very difficult at times to manage in that because people don't necessarily have a good idea of who they're reporting to and who actually has authority to make decisions. But it's becoming much more common to have these cross-functional teams. So knowing where you are in your organization can help a lot in figuring out what you need to do to tailor your own management style um, to make it work in the organization that you're in. Because there's so many different flavors of organizations, and again, this goes across the board, industry, academia, being a manager can look very different. Um, you can have the title manager and it can mean very different things. Obviously it can mean being a team manager with direct reports. Obviously someone who is responsible for um, the yearly review and whether or not someone you know, is progressing through their career, meeting their goals and objectives. Um, and ultimately has the ability to um, decide whether or not a, an employee continues working for the organization. Um, you might be in a, a different type of structure where maybe you're leading a project team. So maybe instead of having direct reports, you are responsible for a pot of money or budget or resource. So you are the ultimate authority in making the decisions for a project, um, which can have its own manager structure and then what's very, very common, something that I'm um, very experienced in is being in a position where you're leading perhaps direct reports, but also projects and initiatives without direct authority. Um, leading or managing without direct authority means that you have to put in a considerable amount of time and getting buy-in because 
when it comes down to it, you don't have the oversight to make decisions about people's employment. Not that you should, I'm very much of the opinion that fear is not the same as respect. And the people who are managing at a position of, I have the ability to fire you are never successful. But when you don't necessarily have that lever to pull, it can be very challenging, especially if you're not a naturally, um, you don't have a high, you know, emotional intelligence. We'll talk about a little bit about that. Um, if that's not your strength, leading without formal authority can be really, really tough. And you're going to see all of them in your career, regardless of where you are, very likely. And so knowing which one applies to your work environment will be really, really uh important. I will just say that if you are leaving without a formal authority and navigating that, you're not alone. <laughs> it's always been known as being really challenging. So I, either you're, if you're in a managerial role now, or perhaps at one point in your career, you weren't, you maybe thought, wow, I'm going to work so hard and I am going to do a great job. And then I'm going to get my own team and I'm going to be a manager and it's going to be great. And I'm going to be the best manager that ever managed anyone ever. And I'm not going to be like any manager that I've ever had. You know, I'm going to be so much better. The reality is, is very often, especially technical experts are given the responsibility with no training with, for people in team management, but that's not an excuse to not learn about who you are as a person and, subsequently a manager and um, take any opportunity that you can to do things like this, you know, learn more about what tools are out there. Um, another thing that has was a challenge to me as someone who loves learning and just can absorb as much as I possibly can. Some things you can only learn on the job. There are just some things about managing people that you may never learn from a book or a YouTube video or a LinkedIn learning class. Um, and that's okay um, because uh, that's just part of, part of what it's like to learn to be a good manager and being humble and knowing that is really important. And knowing that people are always our most important resource. I've never worked with anyone in a managerial position who, if they ever treated their employees or colleagues as a resource that can be re easily replaced, have they been particularly successful? Um, people are overwhelmingly worth the time and effort to get to know and to do, you know, do well by and to be a good manager for. So key management things, these are things that I personally um, am constantly working on, that I am absolutely transparent, that I also have struggled with all of these things at varying degrees. Um, and these are just things that I keep in mind um, in my own role. One is communication. One, be clear, be concise, be direct, and as transparent as much as possible. Honestly, I um, have learned what, you know, what I feel might be over communication, maybe not enough communication for some people. Um, and sharing as much detail with your team or with others whenever you can and when it's appropriate. And we'll talk a little bit about that too, because um, there are just some things as a manager that may be inappropriate for you to share. And even through this, the sake of transparency and camaraderie with your team, there may be positions where you have to say um, that you can't share something, but overwhelmingly um, being a good communicator is say 80% of being a good manager. Um, emotional intelligence, there's so much literature written about this. I will recommend a book at the end of this that I've really liked as someone who is fairly no well known for being direct. Um, and I will say that uh, it's not just the soft skills. I actually don't really love that term, soft skills. We'll talk about that, but there's nothing soft about it. Emotional intelligence is actually incredibly difficult for most people. Um, and it has nothing to do with, um, you know, your area of expertise or anything like that. Delegation and decisiveness. You can't do everything on your own, nor should you. And we all have heard about micromanagers, um, people who need to have control over the work that they're doing. But there's also, this is something I will always be thinking about, you have to be able to give opportunities to your team and let them develop. They will never get better at what they do and grow if you do not give them opportunities to do so. Everyone's favorite conflict resolution, you do in 
certainly more than one seminar on just that. Um, but the tough conversations, they're always going to be tough. There's no amount of books <laughs> or webinars or anything that's going to make those necessarily easier, but avoiding them does not make that situation any better. Um, but learning how you respond to conflict and investing in yourself and in resources with your team to help navigate those situations is really important. You have no control about how your employees and how your colleagues are going to respond to something, you only have 100% control over your own behavior in any situation. So invest in making sure that you're doing as much as you can to be a good manager. Um, people development, um, you know, we are kind of always trained to look out for ourselves <laughs> and look out for um, what we are, you know, kind of How's my career going? Am I getting enough exposure? Am I doing the right work? Am I, you know, to, is my team big enough? Can I get more people, more resources? Um, sometimes we don't think about so much about those people on the team. Are they getting um, the development that they need? Is there, are you promoting a growth culture? Is it okay to want to learn new things? Um, and you need to be able to back that up with professional and personal opportunities for your employment, for your employees. And then change management. This is not necessarily one that comes up all the time in kind of the top five skills to be a great manager. But I will say that had I invested more energy and training and just awareness in what change management is and how important it is, especially as organizations nowadays are constantly reorganizing and getting new hires and people leaving and structure changing and all of that, being able to navigate a team through those changes calmly and considerably um, is, I can't begin to describe how valuable the skill set that is. You should never assume that your team is just going to go with it and, with something and the assumption <laughs> that, you know, and kind of operating from a place of like it or leave it is also not a great, you know, option either. So that's another one that I recommend um, investing more time on. So communication, like I said, it's one, you know, what does it mean to be a good communicator? What am I actually saying? Um, so in an ideal world, information would just be freely shared amongst all appropriate team members. We would all get the same information. No one would feel like they're being, um, anything's being held or, you know, there's information that's being kind of squirreled away by someone in a power move. And I think a lot of us have heard of that in the past. Um, in an ideal world, you know, the appropriate information would go directly to the people who need it. In reality, people are people. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that information can get lost and not shared. I'm not going to focus on the malicious ones. Um, these are things that I have come to learn as I've gone through uh, my career in the various places that I've worked. Um, more than anything, I talk about this a little bit, but giving people grace and not assuming off the bat, unless you have some reason to think, but taking a step back and saying, there might be something else going on as to why I didn't hear something or know something that has nothing to do with um, any sort of bad connotation, malicious issue. Um, very often people can assume that the key information that has been maybe discussed in one conversation was appropriately passed on. People can assume that maybe others aren't interested. I have been um, subject to that where it's like, oh, I would have shared that. I just assumed you didn't care. I've learned very often that probably isn't a great assumption to make. Um, passive communication, I think, is a really big struggle, especially in a remote world um and where most of our i don't know company and, and especially in industry communication happens via email uh sending an email to someone and communicate and then checking that off the list like okay i communicated on to the next thing very rarely works um it helps you feel good that you you've done your part you've communicated you've sent that really long email with all the information that needs to be said and you sent it and now it's on the other person to get it and understand it. But very rarely does that actually mean that the communication has been sent and received. There's lots of work and I'm happy to recommend other things that um, and training that I'm aware of about the different types of communication in the managerial role. 
but to say, I just want to say that that has been in my lived experience, something that I'm always trying to be better at is not just sending out an email and assuming that people have been communicated with. And then of course, you know, there's just, you know, people are people, everyone's going through stuff right now. Right. You know, and as always, and the unintentional lack of sharing due to stress or overwhelm or what have you, um, just again, if you're curious, take initiative and ask. The worst thing is someone tells you, uh, I can't tell you that for whatever reason, right? But if you hear something, ask, um, get curious and, and ask the question. I think that will go a lot farther than spiraling and spinning. Um, so again, if something's important, use multiple forms of communication. Use email, use messaging, stop by someone's desk if you can and verbally have a conversation. Um, as an elder millennial, the thought of picking up a phone, not my favorite, but that also can work. Um, but use more than one type of converse communication tool if it's important. Set intentional time to talk with your team members, whether that's one-on-one -on -one every week or every two weeks, but set your calendar time to do that. Never assume that you've communicated unless that person has said to you that they have acquired and understand <laughs> that information. Um, but also just because you want to know something or you have an employee who wants to know something or they, you know, they want you to share as a manager, it's your role to understand where those boundaries are um, and also be able to have those conversations of, nope, it's not appropriate or I can't share something. Um, and then of course, learn to give and receive constructive feedback, which in itself is an entire skill set that, can, that will take a lifetime to master, um, but definitely one that I recommend. Okay, emotional intelligence, nothing soft about it. Emotional intelligence for especially like myself, people who aren't, um, I don't know if I wanna say naturally warm, but just, you know, I, you know, I myself, I've always been very direct with people. I, I've always been that way. And so this is something that I focused a lot of energy on in, in that sense. Um, but more than anything for all of this, you need to know yourself. You need to have a good sense of how you respond to, to things um, in the workplace and in your personal life. And that's on you to figure out because you can read all the emotional intelligence books in the world about how other people respond to things but until you know how you respond to things, none of it's gonna matter. How do you, especially when you respond when you're stressed, are you aware of how your institution or organization's culture might be impacting how your team's navigating, especially if you're coming into a new company or a new place or new lab, what have you? Um, don't assume that you have all the information when someone is coming to you with a concern. And can you be attentive and empathetic to others? Active listening is key. Looking at people, shaking your heads, acknowledging that you have heard what they're saying, not just waiting to speak until, you know, waiting for that person to stop speaking so that you can then speak. These are all tools that will be helpful regardless of whether or not you're in a managerial position. But again, having that sense of self-awareness and how you act in situations is the first step. Um, and then figuring out how, knowing that how you can work with others and how you can manage others um, is a skill that can be learned. Many people, especially as you move up in your career and you get better and better at certain things. Um, you know, a lot of us are self-described doers. You get to levels of more responsibility and get rewarded with promotions and what have you because you've gotten a lot of things done um, because you're good at um, crossing things off the to-do list. Maybe you were given projects as an individual contributor that you did very well on. And so now your organization's saying, here, we're gonna promote you to being a manager. Here is a team to manage or a pile of resources, go at it. Um, but the problem is, is that that same mentality of, I, I have this list of I, things that I individually control. And as long as I accomplish that, that's the only thing that matters, goes out the door the second that you are a manager. At least it should, because um, you're no longer responsible <laughs> or just accountable for the work that you personally are doing. You're also accountable for the work of your team and accountable for them having opportunities to learn from the work that you're doing. Um, 
you might also feel like you want to have some sense of control about how the work is done. Like I have to do it myself or I'm not, it won't be right. Um, and that's different than micromanaging. <laughs> um, it is too, micromanaging is a way of navigating that. But for some people, they just won't even let other people do it and then micromanage. They'll just do it themselves. Like, I'm just going to do it myself if I want it done right. Um, you have to know your team, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but you have to know your team, and that takes time to know what, what tasks and which team members can take on additional work. But use it as a professional development opportunity for yourself and your team. It's something that I'm always working on, frankly, is it's sometimes you don't want to have to delegate something that maybe you personally really want to do because you're good at it and you like it and it's comfortable and you've been doing it for a long time. Those are the things that you do want to delegate <laughs> to team members because maybe they haven't done it before. Um, maybe something that is very comfortable and easy for you is a brand new thing for someone else to tackle. And you had to learn it for some, you know, the first time. And now is the time to give that opportunity to someone else. Conflict resolution. So I'm a big believer that not everyone you work with has to be friends. Um, it is great when you can be friendly with everyone in your workplace. Um, great if you can be social and maybe you have some outside of work, you know, friendships and things like that. But I, you know, it's unrealistic to think that you're going to have, that you'll be best friends with every single person that you work with in a professional workspace. But it is not unre unrealistic to expect everyone to be professional and respectful in, in the workplace. And that's where, you know, that's a line that for some can be very hard to draw. Um, just because someone may not be outwardly friendly, um, maybe they don't want to go to the team I don't know, birthday celebration or something like that, right? Not everyone wants to or needs to participate in those sorts of things, but everyone should come to a professional workplace and be professional and respectful. And if that is not happening, that is where, and as a manager, you absolutely have to step in and navigate your team through conflict. If you have issues navigating, and again, you can do an entire <laughs> multi-day, I'm sure, workshop on just conflict resolution, but as a manager, knowing when to step in when you have conflict amongst employees and when to wait it out is important because sometimes you just want to swoop in and fix it, make it go away. But oftentimes people don't learn to navigate conflict themselves if you do that. Um, and you also have to know when do you want to get an outside opinion or maybe HR support or things like that. And those are decisions you have to make as a manager when you have those types of issues. Conflict resolution between yourself as a manager and an employee. Lots of things that I've kind of thought through as navigating these sorts of things. Myself is do you share a common goal? Um, is this a singular instance or a long-term problem? Um, and one thing I like to think about is how much of the effort and energy that you're putting into this conflict is happening with the person you actually have conflict with? And behind the backs with other you know people in in the office you know that sort of thing because if it's way more talking behind people's backs versus actively navigating the conflict with the person you have conflict with that isn't going to get anywhere and it's a lot more comfortable not engaging in conflict but you know airing out your issues than it is actually dealing with it but the people who are good managers and long-term leaders are the ones that can actually deal with conflict and in a, in a professional way and this is again where active listening can come in people development um very often especially if you're someone who personally is always liking to learn always wanting to new opportunities wanting to move up in your organization you know you're just in that mindset going up and up and up um it can be kind of difficult to wrap your mind around why someone would want to come to work every day for many years and do the same thing. Um, when I was younger, I definitely had a hard time with that. It's like, well, what's the point if you're not trying to like get to the next step? Um, now, several years in, I have come to absolutely and deeply respect the value of both. Um, on a team, you need to have people who are hungry and want to learn new things and, and be ambitious. But you also have so much value in the people who have spent years honing their skills on specific things and are 
have institutional knowledge of the work that you're doing. Both are very important and you need as a manager to find ways to reward both. Um, just because someone isn't actively constantly looking for a promotion does not mean they don't need to be recognized and rewarded in some way. Um, this is where you need to look for tools outside of your toolkit. I mean, yes, using your own personal network and, and skills can go a long way, but don't assume as a manager that you singularly have <laughs> all of the knowledge of professional development for your employees. Use, you know, figure out if there are resources you can tap into. And, but you also need, and this is a hard conversation, especially with those really ambitious people, is setting realistic timelines and goals for your members. Um, and this goes back to the organizations that you exist in. If you work in a company where there's only so many roles and there's very few rungs in a ladder, um, you're not gonna do yourself any favors by promising someone who's worked there for six months that they're gonna get a promotion <laughs> anytime soon. Um, so those are things you just need to be aware of and navigate. Is there a question, Karen? We have a few questions in now. Um, so the okay. first question was back on conflict management. Could mm -hmm. you give us an experience dealing with conflicts with peers and how that was solved successfully? Ah, uh, it's <laughs> a good one. Um, so I am... <laughs> I have been fortunate that I haven't had too many, I would say, combative experiences in the workplace. I am one of those people that likes to just go at it, not in like a combative way, but I like, so I'm the type of person, and this has worked for me. I wouldn't say it's going to work for everyone, but I'm the type of person that when I know that there's some sort of conflict someone has with me, I go seek that person out. That has never failed me. It may at some point, but I'm not someone who is comfortable sitting in unresolved conflict in any way. Um, it just makes my work environment that much worse and it's not energy I want to spend. So um, I've had a few instances where I've had colleagues where all of them were related to some sort of miscommunication. I think one of them I can think of in my mind was due to a complete lack of communication out of really no malintent, just frankly overwhelmed and didn't send an email. And um, hearing that there was you know some issues with it, I went directly to that person. And historically that has always been how I how I do it. I am not a I have not found passive approaches to be successful, especially in a professional workplace, because um, you're all there, you're all experts, you know, you're all degreed, you're all there for a reason. Um, let's not waste anyone's time and energy with, you know, some of the more elementary and middle school behavior. So, um, it's probably about as specific as I can make it. We have another question here more on the people development side. Um, and this one says, what happens when your team doesn't have the same education or communication training, um, is solving issues around communications or behaviors? Ah, that's a really good question. And I would, this is definitely one where I'd, if we could, I'd love to open up to kind of group think because this is, um, I think that if you are willing to put in the time and effort to provide resources and outlets for communication or your company or your organization are, everyone, regardless of their education level, can have a Product, ha, can have an adult conversation um, in that sense. Um, and if they can't, if you have an employee who truly can't, it may have nothing to do with their education level or their communication skills. It might just be that they just don't want to have that conversation and, and don't want to participate. And that in itself is an issue. But I have found that removing any sort of internal bias that I might personally have um, or going into a conversation because of maybe different backgrounds, training, that sort of thing. Um, I have found that people generally come to the table um, wanting to have a conversation, but not if you not if you haven't put in any time or effort to better understand from their perspective what the issue is. Um, and if you can't get those resources internally, um, that's where. I think most people struggle is not having the external resources to navigate that different team uh, in their communication levels. Um, but I would advocate for that 
I think that's something I, I'm, I care a lot about is advocating for people, regardless of their education level, to be given opportunities to develop professionally so that they can be professional in the workplace. There's a follow-up um, comment on that is that remembering that in tropics, not everyone finished their middle school. Yep, yep, exactly. Um, exactly. And navigating that, that's something that I would love to hear from others if you have experience with it. Um, when it comes down to it, most issues in the workplace, at least from my experience, come down to fundamental core communication issues. It's about respecting people, respecting their boundaries, respecting um, their needs in a workplace. Um, it's respecting, you know, you might not have beyond a middle school degree, but you could be an absolute expert at something in your workplace and your, your education level does not imply anything. If you are an absolute expert in something and when people don't feel like that their expertise is respected because of their education level, um, there's no way to have an open conversation. And so it comes down to it, it's core fundamentals of how to treat people. Um, and that can be really, really hard. Oftentimes it's beyond the skill sets of most people. And that's why as managers, knowing it's beyond your skill set <laughs> can go a long way. Assuming that you know how to solve all these problems um, can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, let's see, change. I kind of went through all this. I guess the only other things I wanted to talk about really quickly before we jump to that, though, is that there are tools that are online that have helped me immensely um, when I didn't necessarily feel like I had resources. Some of them, these are more in kind of like the industry setting, but I like knowing your people, going back to what that question was, knowing people, knowing how they like to be spoken to, know what they want to be recognized for, treating everyone with respect, baseline respect. That's just, that's just the entry level. That is just how everyone should be treated, regardless of what they're doing or their background. Um, but there are also tools that help you better understand where people want to grow and areas that they're just naturally gifted in. I like the Strength Finder from Clifton Strengths Gallup. Um, we can send a link out for that if anyone's interested. Um, that just tells you, because you know, most development on um, these sorts of things tell you all the things you're bad at, and then they sell you things to help you fix them. And this is a really nice way to um, focus on the things that you're naturally good at and what you can bring to a team as you are without having to go through any other training. And then going back to yeah, team culture. So as a manager, think a lot about the type of culture that you want to participate in. Um, what are the characteristics of a good leader or good manager in that sense? Communication, trust, being collaborative, being inclusive, you know, regardless of what people are doing, recognizing and highlighting unique strengths, being transparent. We talk about authentic leadership in its own, <laughs> its own section. Um, and then managers versus leaders, they're not the same. Managers are meant to be dealing with the complexity of day-to-day -day work. And leaders are the ones who should be setting the standard of how people what the goals people are doing, the vision for your group, and that baseline understanding of how people should be treated in an organization. Um, managers should be expecting leaders to be setting that and participating in that conversation. And knowing when to manage and when to lead um, can be tough sometimes. Um, and then there's some tips. So manage your time accordingly. Whatever's on your calendar are the things that should be the most important to you. So if you need to talk to your team members, put that on the calendar. Don't just make it something, oh, I should probably check in with someone or buy a body. Make it dedicated, intentional time. I know for me, everyone on my team knows that if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't exist. Um, make sure that everyone in your group is aligned with the top priorities. That's where things can get really hard. I like to use the big three so that I want to make sure that the things that I think someone should be prioritizing are the things that they're prioritizing. Um, know when to call and support. Always have a learner's mindset. Um, and then I just wanted to finish up with reality when you're a member of a team. <laughs> there are no better managers than people who have never managed people. <laughs> um, managers are people from time to time. They will fail. Learn from those experiences and take it into your own management style. You can hold people accountable for not being a good manager and for not representing and not doing what they need to do. You can also show them grace and flexibility when it's appropriate. Obviously, there are times when it's not, and that's when you really do need to put in um, a boundary. But remember that for most, unless you have a reason not to, trying to give people benefit of the doubt 
is generally the best path to go. And when you're leading teams, you might be the biggest technical expert in something, and that doesn't mean anything as to whether or not you're a good manager. Um, so be open to new skills and more than anything, be humble because um, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have or how long you went to school, frankly. Um, that doesn't mean anything. As long as you invest in, in knowing yourself and knowing how you can be the best manager you can be outside of your technical education is what matters. And then there's just a book that I really like, recommended um, Radical Candor by Kim Scott. Love this. It's a great way to learn how to um, give really, really good feedback in a kind way that's professional, but gets to the point. I'm for one, I hate compliment sandwiches. If someone tells me this was great, this was horrible, this is great, I'm already upset <laughs> just because you did that to me. Um, this is a really great book um, that walks through that. So, all right, Q&A questions? Um, just real quick, um, and as I'm going through this, feel free to submit your questions through the chat, through the Q&A feature, or if you want to speak directly to Megan, go ahead and raise your hand. Use the raise hand speak um, feature, and we'll bring you um, on audio to speak with her. So quickly, these are the upcoming events and opportunities for the YPC. We have our next upcoming networking happy hour between the YPC and AFE's Board of Trustees, um, which includes Megan, on October 17th. So if you could save that date, I'll be in touch shortly with additional details on that. And then we're also looking for our next YPC moderator for our Grow Pro webinar series. We're looking for somebody who will do October, November, and December. So if that's something you're interested in, please let me know. It's a great opportunity to both hear the latest findings of research, but also network directly with AFE's researchers and practice your public speaking. Um, and if any of these interest you and you're not already on the YPC, you can join at endowment.org slash YPC. It's totally free. And if you have any questions about it, my email is up there um, and you can reach out to me at any time. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and stop the recording now and open it up for full open Q&A.